Welcome to Shaping the Future. In this episode, I am speaking with Dr. Zach Leib at Colorado State University's Department of Atmospheric Science about the perilous heat trends reshaping the Arctic. Zach is very well known on social media for bringing the climate data to life in a series of visualizations and charts that depict extremes, such as we have seen recently in the Laptev Sea, where the start of the sea ice formation is yet to begin. In this discussion, we also talk about improving the general public's overall literacy on climate change and why panicking is not the preferred course of action. This is one in a series of interviews that seeks to gain insights into how scientists consider communicating changes in the Earth's system to wider audiences in order to promote greater awareness and understanding. Thanks for listening to Shaping the Future. In the next episode, I'll be speaking with Professor Bill Maguire about his new book, Sky Seed. This novel tells the fictional, apocalyptic story of a geoengineering experiment that has a chilling outcome. You can subscribe on any major podcasting channel or listen on YouTube. For more information on CCLS and this series, please visit climateseries.com. Hi, Zach. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me today. I'm going to start by asking you about the loss of Arctic sea ice. Can you define the difference between the older ice and the single year ice? Sure, I think when, maybe I'm biased, but when we think of climate change, the Arctic is one of the first places that comes to mind. And essentially we know climate change is causing the earth to warm. So when you think of warming temperatures, you think of melting ice. So the two are very much associated together and loss of Arctic sea ice, I really consider being one of the primary indicators that we have of climate change. We are seeing losses of ice, not only in terms of the area or extent, and when I'm referring to extent of ice, I'm just talking about the total area that's ice covered. So the extent of ice is shrinking somewhere on the order of you know 10% per decade at the end of the summer months. But it's also that the thickness of ice is decreasing. So it's becoming thinner and thinner ice, and that thinner ice is more vulnerable to further melting. So when we think of older versus younger ice, if you traveled to the Arctic several decades ago, you would find a region that was not only colder and had more ice, but you would find the ice was older and the older ice is thicker. So what happens is during the winter, we see sea ice grow. It grows in thickness, it grows in area. And during the summer months, when it warms up in the Arctic and you get 24 hour daylight, the sea ice melts. And what happens is every year, independent of climate change, the sea ice, some sea ice melts. The problem we're facing is that more and more ice is melting during the summer months. So the idea of older versus younger ice is that any ice that survives the summer, then we consider that being multi-year ice or old ice. Essentially has, at the end of summer, we call call it the sea ice birthday. Sea ice becomes uh, several years older. And then over time, that older and older ice gets thicker and thicker. But now we're in an area of the Arctic where we're seeing more and more ice melt in the summer. So less, less sea ice birthdays. And because it's less and less old ice, it's thinner. So in general, the Arctic has transitioned to a region that used to be predominantly older ice to now one that's, that's young, single year ice, and much of it only survives for one year. Okay, and presumably there are differences in characteristics between the, the older ice that is sort of thicker and stronger and the, the single year ice which breaks up much easier. As Arctic heating increases, are we just going to see this sort of open Arctic? Yes, so one point about the characteristics, you're right. So. Sometimes I think when we think of the Arctic, it's, it's being this like flat surface of ice, but it's not. The ice, the ice moves around a lot. It's very dynamic, we call it. The ice, pieces of ice can bump together and they can actually form ridges. So when they come together, it pushes the ice up. So the ice is very bumpy and there's all this texture. And we also get snow that accumulates on top of the ice. So sometimes the older ice could accumulate more and more snow because it's going from season to season versus the younger ice. So there's a lot of these characteristic differences between older and the single year ice. 
But we're now in this region where there's very little multi-year ice. There's very little ice that's older than four years in the Arctic. Most of that ice is found north of Greenland right now. It's kind of where the sea ice goes to die, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're now transitioning to the rest of the Arctic being very much thinner ice and single year ice. And the next sort of phase of that is to transition to open water or water that is not completely covered by, you know, solid ice cover, but it's broken. Some people call it more slushy, like, you know, it's slushy ice that's not really condensed harder. So we're seeing the surface of the Arctic is really transitioning. And that's going to affect one of the big drivers of why the Arctic is important. And Maybe we'll get to talk about that later. Okay. There's a lot of imagery around Arctic warming and a lot of it comes from, from you on social media, which is great to see. But when I see it, I feel a certain amount of anxiety because they're generally bad trends we're looking at. But when I talk to people who aren't so engaged in this subject, it's kind of a shoulder shrug. They're not so bothered by it. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of Arctic heating in terms of feedbacks and interactions with the rest of the global climate system. Yeah, that feeds exactly what I was just saying about the surface. So I want to just first start off with why, why is the Arctic an important region for the whole Earth's climate? And it's the idea that during the summer when there's 24 hour daylight, you get lots of sunlight coming into the Arctic. Decades ago, the Arctic was more sea ice covered. So as that sunlight comes in, it sees this bright white surface of the Arctic and that radiation, that sunlight gets reflected back out into space. So you get a lot of that heat that would have stayed on Earth being sent back out into space. And the problem is now the globe is warming. So we're seeing sea ice loss. And the problem is that now that we're seeing the sea ice loss, we're now removing that white bright surface and now we're leaving a dark open ocean. So when that sunlight comes in, it's not gonna hit that bright white surface. Instead, that incoming solar radiation is going to stay in the ocean and that heat is gonna accumulate more and more as there's more open water. And then at the end of summer, when it becomes winter and there's now 24 hour darkness, as the sea ice tries to begin refreezing, there's all of this heat in the ocean. And as it refreezes, that heat then wants to escape into the colder atmosphere over top of the water. So then you get all of this heat going into the atmosphere in this time of year, in October, November, September. And then that warming is warming the Arctic, which then feeds back into more ice melting. And that's when climate scientists say a positive feedback in the Arctic. What we're really talking about is that it's an acceleration of something ongoing. You increase the temperature, you melt more ice, more ice is being melted, you increase the temperature. And that really is important for Earth's climate because a lot of people consider sort of the Arctic as a refrigerator at the top of our planet, helping to maintain, you know, global temperatures. And now as we're seeing the Arctic warming faster than any other region on Earth, we're seeing this unbalanced part of our climate system. And broadly, that's why we're concerned about the Arctic. Okay. And that kind of leads in to one of your posts I saw recently about the Laptev Sea, which is referred to as the cradle of sea ice at this time of year, is where it literally starts to refreeze. Can you talk a bit about what you're seeing and why this is significant? Right. So recently I've been posting graphs of a region called the Laptev Sea. And if you're not familiar with the Arctic, that's okay. This is a part of the Arctic that is located north of Siberia. So when we look at Arctic climate change, it's really important to understand that the Arctic is big and there are regional differences in the Arctic. And the Laptev Sea is one of these regions. And this time of year, we normally start to get the sea ice refreezing in the Laptev Sea. Actually, normally by the end of October, early November, this area is normally completely frozen over. Go back to 1980, this would be frozen water. The problem is this year is when I'm plotting a graph of the total extent of ice in the Laptev Sea, there's very little this year. And it's really alarming to see that in most years, this would have been a completely frozen ocean, but this year we have open water. So I think this is a real indicator of an extreme event that's going on in the Arctic and trying to understand 
why isn't the sea ice refreezing and when is it going to start refreezing are really interesting questions that climate scientists are currently thinking about. And one of the things that seems to be a conversation around the Arctic is when are you going to have a blue Arctic? And it doesn't matter about trying to guess when that's going to be. But is this kind of event the sort of indicator that we're moving in that direction? That's a great point. So I say that this extreme event is an indicator consistent with Arctic climate change. But me as an atmospheric scientist and a climate scientist, there's something also important to keep in mind is that there is substantial year-to-year -year variability in the Arctic. Meaning this year, the sea ice isn't refreezing in the Laptev Sea until November. But next year, perhaps the Laptev Sea refreezes earlier than this year. And that's this idea that in the atmosphere, there's a lot of chaos. We know this just thinking about daily weather in our hometown. One day it can be warm and sunny and the next day cold and rainy. The same idea applies in the climate systems, that there's a lot of variability, but we have long-term trends. And when I communicate climate science, that's what I'm interested in communicating, is that we know if you average together multiple decades, that the amount of ice in the Arctic and in the Laptev Sea region is decreasing. But there's these bumps or year-to-year -year variability. So it's difficult to really extrapolate any information from this year's current extreme to next year because of this year to year variability. But with more confidence, I can say that we know in the long term trend there is decreasing ice. But this variability, that's what makes it hard to guess when we get more of this open ocean, blue ocean event. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And was the Laptev event something you anticipated? Not to say, oh, it's keep an eye on the Laptev. Is it something that you, this time of year you would naturally look there to see what's going on? I know for journalists, you know, they want catchy headlines and it's always a good headline to say, client, you know, scientists are baffled. <laughs> I, no, I am not surprised. Um, you know, I've been tracking extreme events in the Arctic for a couple of years now on social media. And, you know, these graphs are pretty shocking when you get these outlier events. But really, when I'm thinking about the broad scheme of things, I, I'm not surprised to see events like this. A few years ago, we had something like this happen in the Bering Sea, which is a region near Alaska. It was an outlier compared to any other year we ever had. And then the next year was much closer to average, you know, still less than normal, but closer. So it's this idea that I try to emphasize is we expect a long-term decrease in ice and then we expect extremes on top of that trend. We might have a year, you know, soon where there is more ice than the last couple of years, just because of this year to year variability. If you plot a graph going through the end of the century, it's gonna be a really squiggly line that's slowly going down over time. I call these extreme events on top of this long-term climate change trend. And I think we can anticipate an increasing chance of these types of events going forward, especially different regions of the Arctic. It might not be a Laptev next year. Next year could be back in the Bering Sea, but we don't know quite yet. Okay. And what about acceleration in the trend? Is there any of that, do you think? I get asked a lot, is it worse than the climate model projections? And that's a tough question to answer how you frame it. But I, I think one thing is the climate models have been showing these I'll call them dire trends in the Arctic for a long time. And maybe us as climate scientists don't show enough what these climate models are projecting and how extreme the losses of ice and temperature actually are. And the climate models are capturing. There is this substantial variability. So you could argue some climate models are not showing as much warming as observations, but we just don't have enough observations, in my view, to make statements, you know, is this getting worse or worse than we expected? And to me, I think it's consistent. I look at these climate model projections of the Arctic, and they show a radically changing Arctic by the end of the century. And I think me as you know, trying to communicate the science, I think I'm going to try to focus on that a bit more too. Okay, that's a good place just to zoom back from the Arctic for a second. And emissions are still rising. And the Paris Agreement sort of slips out of view with the COP, this important COP being delayed, mixed messages from politicians, etc. Do you think these changes in the Arctic should be more prominent when governments make decisions around the fossil fuel industry or anything else that relates to the well-being of a nation's population, for example? 
right? I definitely think we need to consider the Arctic for a couple different reasons. One being, we are already seeing climate change happen now in the Arctic. And I think the image most people have when you say Arctic is probably ice and a polar bear. But we should keep in mind that there are many communities that live in the Arctic. And I think we need to elevate the voices of these communities in the Arctic about the challenges they are already facing and about the other challenges they will be facing for more climate change. And they really need to have a major voice in these conversations when we talk about future decisions on energy, because these are people who are going to face some of the most substantial climate change, interrupting their economies and way of life that they've had for hundreds of years. I think that's something that's really important in my own work. I, I want to think about how can I elevate the voices and listen to those voices that are observing the changes in their communities. And I expect those are people with tiny carbon emissions themselves. I mean, they're inheriting the mess of our communities in developed countries, really. Do your posts, you post a lot, and some of it is telling, it's definitely telling the story of the trends. I think that's fair to say. Do your posts impact how you live outside your day job in terms of your own choices as a scientist and a human? I think I'm going to answer this by relating it to my work. I think it actually motivates me to continue doing what I'm doing. I post, if you don't know, I post graphs of pretty complex data. And my goal is to really break it down and visualize it in a more clear manner for, you know, a broad and accessible audience. And I've been so, you know, happy and motivated to see how many people are really interested in the data and what's happening, looking at it. So I think it's actually, you know, I'm frustrated sometimes, you know, making these graphics when people are sending mean comments about it and skeptical. But in total, it really motivates me to continue sharing what I do day to day as science, what I'm observing, and you know what impacts we could face going forward in the future. I work on physical climate impacts in mm -hmm. climate models. My, my science is very much dynamically based, so I don't work as much on the solution side of things, but I think it motivates me more to continue sharing the science and you know, share my experiences with communicating. So a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you keep making these quote, sad graphics? And I, I'm happy that I am fortunate enough to have a base that I can actually share this information with others and that so many people want to learn and hear more. Yeah, and I think you're really improving or helping to improve people's literacy around these events, which I think is a, a really critical job in a way. It helps us avoid cliches around sustainability and just taking all of this for granted so yeah it, it is really important just the last question to finish on really what is the one thing that you find yourself really wanting to grasp in relation to climate change i think i struggle with communicating like a graphic of the laptop sea which shows 2020 looks like it's headed out into its own land and, you know, I struggle to put that into perspective about these trends versus variability that I've been talking over and over about is that this doesn't mean everything is doomed when you see these lines. I think these are wake up calls and indicators that if we don't do something systematically about climate change, this line you're going to see happen more and more often. But we're still at a point where, you know, the long term trend hasn't gone to zero. And there is an opportunity right now to raise awareness about climate change and support evidence-based policies that prevent further climate change so we don't keep seeing these outlier lines on the graphs. I think my goal is to communicate that we're not doomed and you know there's still plenty of opportunity and to share, you know, keep sharing the data and evidence-based science wherever you go. Well, that's a fabulous place to finish this conversation so thank you very much for taking the time it's been really good to talk to you yeah thank you